we're going to start back over in Acts chapter 19. And a uh, uh, very interesting passage of scripture uh, on so many different levels. Uh, and so I'm I'm going to I'm going to read uh, seven verses here, the first seven verses of this chapter. Uh, we read part of them last week, talked about some of this stuff last week, but we're, we're going to hit on some things and uh, I'll just show you some of my, my pet things and, and we'll we'll go from there. Acts 19, it says, and it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, so he's he's at Corinth now. And we talked about the fact that Apollos only knew John's baptism, and I, I believe he was saved there in, in uh, uh, Ephesus. But while he was at Corinth, uh, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. So there were some people here, probably even people that may have been a, attached to Apollos. I, I don't believe there's, there's any accidents with the way these names connect together and the belief system connects together. So with that said, he found certain disciples there. He said to them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said to them, uh, we have not so much as heard as uh, whether there be any Holy Ghost. And so they don't even know anything about the day of Pentecost. They don't even understand things that John himself uh, said so. So let's finish reading this. And he said unto them, "Unto what then were you baptized?" And they said, "Unto John's baptism." If we were to go back and look at John, we're going to in just a second. But if we just go back and look at John, he explained some things to people, but they didn't catch it. Paul's going to connect the dots for them. Then said Paul, "John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him that should come." Uh, after him, that is on Christ Jesus, all right? And that's exactly what John uh, said. He said, there's one coming after me whose who's, uh, shoes I'm not even worthy to untie. He said, I baptize with water, but there's one going to come after me that's going to baptize with the Holy Ghost, all right? And uh, so he's, even John himself separated his baptism from what was going to take place from what was going to take place, okay? Uh, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came upon them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all men were about 12. All right, so there was about 12 of these apostles. I find that number pretty interesting um, in that that's what Jesus had too. He had, he had about 12 apostles that followed him and here's about 12 people that are following john's baptism so let's before we get into the holy spirit and, and all of that let's talk about this this baptism um and and draw some uh distinctions there's a distinction uh, made of john's baptism and we see it here it says in acts 1 Verse 22, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from among us. Now, in the book of Acts, we'll find that uh, John's baptism or the baptism of John is mentioned four different times. This is one of them in Acts 19. There's one in Acts 18, one in Acts 13, and one in Acts 1 where I just read. Now, what was going on in Acts 1 was Peter was given the stipulations that as he saw it uh, on uh, what it meant to to appoint another apostle in the in the place of Judas. And so he said they, they needed to have been with them from John's baptism all the way up until the ascension. Now later on we find out that Peter was just wrong. But uh, and so then in Acts 18, what we read last week, uh, talking about Apollos, said that he, he knew only the baptism of John. So John's baptism. So what is John's baptism? Mark chapter 1, verse 4. 
The Bible says, John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So this is one of the uh, one of the characteristics of it. And we know that Jesus was baptized by John, which baptism, what baptism does is it, it don't save us, but it identifies us with a message. So when Jesus was baptized under John's message, it was just that. He was attaching himself to this message of John. And if we were to go study all that, we'd see the Holy Spirit descends upon him. God uh, speaks from heaven, says, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. And, you know, Jesus comes straight way out. He didn't, he didn't confess no sins like everybody else did because he had none. He was sinless. But he was identifying himself with the message. And later on, John would say, this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. All right, so uh, John uh, baptized for the remission of sin, for repentance, for the remission of sin. So uh, in, in Luke chapter 7, verse 29, it says, all people heard him talking about John and the publicans, which... As you study the Gospels, you know that the publicans were considered the, the lowest of sinners in the whole, whole community. The publicans justified God. So now this is, God's justified by something. Being baptized with the baptism of John. So uh, they, they recognized God's work in John. That's basically what, what was happening as John preached uh, and said, prepare for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, they would go and be baptized and, and they would confess their sins. All right. And it justified God. And then in Acts 13, 24, this was, this was uh, Paul preaching and he gives us some further indication of what John, John's baptism was. He said, when John had first preached before his, his, uh, coming, talking about Jesus coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. So the message was not to all of the people. It was to all of the people of Israel. What was Israel doing? Israel was preparing for Messiah, their king to come set up and rule in Jerusalem. That's what John was preparing them for. That's what the Old Testament talked about um, Elijah preparing uh, the way for the Messiah, making straight the way and, and bringing the hills low and, and bringing the low places up to a flat ground. And he was, he was preparing the people for the message. So that was John. John was preparing the people to meet the king of Israel. All right. But they rejected their king. Now, I don't have time to connect all these dots to go show you this. But when we see Jesus given the great commission before his ascension back into heaven, he said, go into Jerusalem and in Judea and into Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. Okay, you take this message. What message? The message of the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So now let me just say this to you. I said this last week. I said this a few weeks ago when we was talking about baptism. But I, I want to drive this home. There is so many people that miss salvation by those 18 inches right there from their head to their heart. Let me just move this down. From, from their heart to their head. They get a head knowledge but they never get a heart knowledge. There's a miscarriage before they're born again. Uh, Matthew 13 talks about that miscarriage. It says when the, uh, they received the, the word of God into their heart, but then before it could take root, Satan pulls it out. There's a lot of people that, that attach religion, uh, some kind of asceticism, uh, uh, legalism, all kinds of stuff uh, with salvation, but that is not salvation. 
I, I was listening uh, Sunday. I, I was off work Sunday. I, I, I took Sunday off, and, and Jeff Joyce preached for me, and I appreciate that. But um, Sunday morning, I listened to several preachers and watched several services prior to our service, and then I, I, I worshiped with my own church. But one of the preachers that I was listening to, uh, he had a real good lead in. Um, he he had a real good first point in his message, but then his second point, he only had two points. His second point, uh, he starts talking about the gospel. And let me just straighten this out for you. And, and I'm sure that if anybody listens much to this, somebody will disagree with it, and that's okay. There's a lot of confusion today about what the gospel is. Uh, we have people, and, and this man, he was confused. And, and quite frankly, he's a pastor of a, a super large church. <coughs> but his idea of the gospel was the way you live your life. That's the gospel. Uh, you go out and you feed the hungry. That's the gospel. You go out and... and uh, be a nurse, that's the gospel. And you, you go do this, and that's the gospel. And you go get this, and that's the gospel. And that is not the gospel, okay? Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this is the gospel that I preached unto you, that Jesus came according to the scriptures, and that he was crucified according to the scriptures, and that he was buried according to the scriptures, and on the third day he was raised from the dead according to the scriptures. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ right there. Jesus is God. He came to do something you couldn't do, which was go to a cross and, and accept the wrath of God on that cross to be buried because he laid his life down and then be received of Jesus Christ, of God the Father, excuse me, and raised from the dead by the power of God for for your justification. That is the gospel, my friend. Now, once you get saved, you ought to grow. That's sanctification. And the, the, the word of God ought to change the way you do things. It ought to change the way you do things. These people here in Acts chapter 19, they were going about and they were, they were acting on what they knew. All they knew was the baptism of John. They missed that part where John said, and he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And they, they said, we ain't even heard that there was a Holy Ghost come. Paul made it clear to them that there was something else. And these men believed the message and the Holy Spirit fell on them. Now, let me stop and say this to my charismatic friends. <laughs> They like to emphasize speaking in tongues and all that kind of stuff. And in, in the book of Acts, matter of fact, in the whole Bible, but in the book of Acts in the early church, there is four instances that we could say people spoke in tongues. Three of them that clearly says they did, and one we can assume. Acts 2, at the day of Pentecost, when Peter took the keys to the kingdom of heaven and opened up the kingdom of heaven unto the Jews, it showed that the Holy Spirit had been poured out that day in a partial fulfillment of Joel that the Holy Spirit was going to be given to men. The second time was at Samaria. When, the, the again, Peter shows up again and as Peter goes, it does not say that they spoke in tongues, but they probably did because the Holy Spirit fell upon them and they, they recognized that. Again, Peter takes the kingdom uh, keys to the kingdom of heaven that Jesus Christ gave him over in Matthew chapter 16. You go look it up. And he opens the key uh, kingdom of heaven to the Samaritans, those that were half Jewish, half Jewish something else. Then Peter with other 
Jewish believers in Acts 10 went to Cornelius, him being a Gentile, and he takes the keys to the kingdom of heaven and he opens up the kingdom of heaven to the Gentiles. And there it clearly says that they spoke in other languages. And these men recognized it. And that was used later on, mindly, of God in Acts 15 at the first Jerusalem Council to show that the Gentiles were on equal footing with everybody else. Well, here we're give the, given the last time in the book of Acts of an example of somebody speaking in tongues. I don't think we ought to overemphasize the fact that people spoke with other languages. I don't think that ought to be something that we just major on. Um, but here there was a reason behind it. And I believe the reason was for our instruction to show it's not about religion. It's not about uh, joining a church or being baptized. It is about being born again. It is about being saved. It is about you repenting and asking God to save you. And then you start on that life. Oh me. Um, I have, God's blessed me so much here in the last several days, few weeks with things that I've been able to read and um, sermons I've been listening to. And, and it, it's amazing to me when I listen to preachers preach that have been around, when I read books from people that have been all over the place and helped churches everywhere, these guys, they all say the same thing. There is so many people in our churches that are lost. Oh, they may be a Baptist. They may be a Methodist. They may be a Pentecostal. They may be whatever. They may be a member of the church. They may come in and do things or whatever. But they're not really born again. May I emphasize to you today that I don't care whether you come to Cedar Grove Baptist Church or not. I, I, I would love to fill up all the pews. I really would. But my concern is for your salvation. My concern is for your salvation, not, not, not for me to have a feather in my hat. Um, if, if it was about me having a feather in my hat, um, uh, I would have stepped out of this church years ago and and stepped up the ladder like I'm supposed to and 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 went from place to place to place, only concerned about myself. And I've been accused of that, but that's not that's not been the case. I pastored one church, and it's not no great big gigantic church, and and uh, but it's it's a church where God has placed me at. And I'll be here to God places me somewhere else. But uh, but my point is, my my heart is, it goes out to to you today. That you be saved. That you not just be religious. And once you get saved, you need to grow. You you need you need to grow in in discipleship. You, you need to grow in sanctification. And as you grow in sanctification, you need to make sure that you don't become legalistic, but it becomes about a relationship. I, I want to read my Bible daily because of, of a relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to read my Bible daily because I want it to grow me into something else. I, I want to grow. I, I don't want to just go through life and, and, uh, and live on sugar sticks. Uh, I, I just read, <laughs> oh me, I just read in, in a, a book yesterday, last night. Guy asked about, uh, he asked about your relationship 
with, with Christ. And, uh, and he said, would you say it is as an Olympian who is training for the Olympics? Or would you say your relationship with Christ is like a gym rat that goes to the gym several times a week? Or would you say your relationship with Christ is like a couch potato? I'd say most people's relationships like a couch potato. And they they get just a little a little shot of Christianity once a week when they feel like it. But they never ever really truly commit themselves to grow, to grow. Let's go back to this thing. It says in verse two, he said to them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Something about them, Paul knew there was something wrong. And they said, then we, we've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. So, so you know good and well, they haven't, they haven't received the Holy Ghost. All they're, all they're doing is believing John's baptism. And he says unto them, under what were you baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism. Well, John was just making straight the way for Christ. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, you should believe on him which should come uh, after him, that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. I want you to notice that. All right. Now, now let me... <laughs> Let me emphasize something in this last little part. Baptism does not save. It cannot save. I know there's those out there like the Church of Christ and others that teach that baptism uh actually washes away your sins and, and one thing and another. Um, that's not true. That's just not true. Um, baptism identifies you with a message. So now let me deal with something difficult for just a minute. Uh, the church that my daughter-in-law, um, my daughter and my son-in-law go to, it's, it's, one of the finest churches in the state of North Carolina. They they live in another part of the the state. Um, and and I know the pastor there and uh, and that, that particular pastor and it's a large church. That particular pastor he said twice a year they'll have a, a new members class. And said everybody's good. You know, the new members class will be a, a hundred, hundred and fifty people the size of most churches. And, uh, and he said, every year when they, they have those two member, uh, new members classes, said everybody's good until they get to baptism. And when they get to baptism, that is when they will lose 50% of the people that actually have come for new membership. They don't want to be baptized. Or they'll say they have been baptized. Now they're a new believer or they haven't been become a believer. There are religions out there, Catholicism being one of them, that uh, they want to baptize a baby as soon as the baby's born. And uh, that is ludicrous according to scripture. And they say it takes the place of circumcision and there's a big mess with that we see people believe and then they are baptized it's called believers baptism if you're a person and you're listening to me right now and you were baptized and you either have never been born again you've never become a believer you've never asked christ to save you uh, you've never repented of your sins. There's not a change in your life. Uh, that baptism was just a bath. If you're somebody that was baptized 
and later on you came to Christ and you've never been baptized again, then I would argue that you need to be baptized. That is the first order of uh, obedience that Christ gives us. Matthew 28, you can go read that starting in verse 19. You can read that and, and, and I believe you'll see that it is you believe and you're baptized. You believe and you're baptized. That is your first order of obedience. You're baptized. Um, and let me say this, there, there's a certain way you should be baptized. Uh, baptized, <clears throat> the word baptized means to sink. It's the same word for a boat sinking. <clears throat> it does not mean a rain shower. Okay, uh, there's people that want to pour and sprinkle and one thing then another. Um, that is not the example of scripture. Uh, it's not the etymology of the word. They just, uh, you have to understand our word baptize is just a, uh, it's just a uh, transliteration of the word baptismo. And uh, uh, they did that because they were baby baptizers. The, the people that translated the King James Bible were baby baptizers. And so they did that so they wouldn't cause confusion in their church and their belief system and people uh, start throwing rocks at what they're doing. But the Bible gives us the example of immersion. Uh, probably the best place, in other. I mean, there's lots of places they baptized at Aeon because there was much water there. If you were going to sprinkle or pour, you wouldn't need much water. You just need a, a jug, okay? Jesus could have baptized at the well uh, with the jug of water that the Samaritan woman had. You know, I mean, um, in, in Acts uh, 8, the Ethiopian, and they came up out of water. Here's much water. I mean, you don't need much water if if you're going to sprinkle, okay? It's not, Jesus didn't die a little bit. He died a whole lot. And then here comes the best place in scripture. In Romans chapter six, you see the picture. And, and, and we were buried with him and raised in his likeness, okay? That, that's a picture of baptism in, in uh, Romans 6. These people were baptized. Even though they had been baptized one time, they weren't saved. They were baptized after they were saved. And I'm encouraging you today, if you've been uh, born again, you've been saved. I don't care when you was baptized. If you were born again after you were baptized, you need to be baptized again properly. Uh, when I first came here, there was a man in our, our church and I love him to death. I love his wife to death. They're, they're just absolutely great people. Uh, he'd never been baptized properly. And the first time I had a baptism here, he came to me and wanted to be baptized. And uh, I didn't realize that he hadn't been baptized properly, but he did through the teaching and preaching of scripture. So let's put it into a nutshell. You can be religious all you want to be. Religion's not going to save you. Satan just soon take you off of a pew in a Baptist church and take you to hell. Because if he's got you on a pew in a Baptist church, you listen to me just a minute. If he's got you sitting on a pew in a Baptist church and you're not born again, he's going to use you to create problems and trouble for the people that are born again and the people that are trying to serve God. I will guarantee you, trouble follows those religious people that never, ever get saved. We see it all through the book of Acts. Paul was followed around by the religious people that refused to, to uh, receive the message of Christ. They knew a lot about scripture. They knew a lot about God, but they didn't know God personally. They'd never come to a place where they were willing to repent and humble themselves before God. If you're one of those people, by the power of God, get saved. 
Get to, well, people feel bad. People look at me wrong. Man, I'd rather people look at you wrong now than they see you come up before the uh, white throne of judgment and say, well, I thought you was a deacon in the church. I thought you was saved. I thought you was uh, the choir leader. I thought you was this or that. Need to be saved, folks. When you're saved, you need to make a profession of faith publicly, publicly, and then you need to be baptized publicly to identify with the message, and then you need to start growing in Christ. Well, this has been Pastor Marty. I've enjoyed being with you again this week. Until Sunday, may God richly and thoroughly bless you.